Let's continue exploring the universe within art and the art within redstone. I'm your host, Am Ledoux, and this is the third episode of our full video series on learning redstone. Hopefully through this series, I can help you understand redstone well enough to start making your very own custom machines. In our first two episodes, we went over the basics of running dust, some of the basic components, as well as strong and weak power, just a lot of the basics that you will need to know before launching yourself off into different mechanics. But after those episodes, you should have a decent grasp on how to run the redstone where you're trying to get it. And so in our last episode, we even touched on the RS Latch. It is a super helpful tool for beginners to make their own custom machines. And this episode is going to be a continuation from that. We'll be going over the infamous comparator, talk about everything that it does and how you use it, as well as go over some of the basic configurations like the RS latch, the T-flop, clocks, and timers. And once you learn those four configurations, you'll be able to make pretty much any custom redstone that you can come up with. And like I mentioned in previous episodes, there are a thousand different ways to build the same redstone machine, but there's really only a handful of mechanics that you need to know in order to build any of them. And so after watching this video, you should be able to build anything you can think of. Continuing from our last episode, where we talked about how repeaters will strongly power blocks which will power adjacent redstone, and how they can pull a redstone signal out from a weakly powered block, whereas dust cannot do either of these things, it cannot send power through blocks. We also talked about the delay on the repeater, that if you click interact with the repeater it will increase the delay, and of course how they will refresh the signal strength of any redstone line when trying to run dust really far away. But there is one more mechanic hidden behind the repeater that we have yet to talk about and that is their ability to lock each other. So if you send a signal from a repeater into the side of another repeater, it will lock that repeater. And so now once the repeater is locked, the signal will not change no matter what you do. So if it's locked to the on position, it will always be on until it's unlocked. Or if it's locked to the off position, you won't be able to turn it on. Now, to be honest, this is kind of an advanced feature in that it's hard to visualize exactly how this works, especially with timing with other components, so you probably won't really find a use for it, especially when you're starting your redstone journey. But one very simple thing that you can use this for, just to practice, is as a door lock. You know, so if you just have a regular door that opens with a redstone torch, you can put a repeater that controls that torch, and then have another repeater that will lock the one that opens the door. You know, this way you can lock the door open or lock the door closed. And of course, the door control can be a button or a pressure plate, whatever you're using to open and close your door. Basically, all you do is add a repeater into that line so that you can lock that repeater using a lever. You know, that way you can have a lever on the inside of your house that will lock the door closed or lock the door open. You know, it's just a really easy way to play around with this mechanic. But now it's time to move on to the infamous comparator. It is similar to a repeater in that it will send signal from one side to the other. The input side is the one with two torches, and the output side is the one with a little dot. Now the main feature of comparators is that they can look inside of containers and tell you how many items are inside. So if a container has no items, the comparator won't have any redstone signal strength. But if the container has at least one item in it, it will give you a redstone output depending on how many items are inside. The signal strength is determined by the percentage of fullness of the container. And so even things like cauldrons will provide a redstone signal strength based on how full they are. Comparators can also look at containers through a solid block. Not only does this give you more options when running the redstone around the container, but it also allows you to look at your chest through a wall so that you can fully hide the redstone. And it's important to note that the comparator can only look through a solid block, not like around the solid block. So it can't see this cauldron right here, it needs to be straight through. But comparators are what allow us to make things like item sorters. Like this is an item sorter or an item filter, so the bottom hopper is locked so it won't pull items out of the top hopper. And the comparator is looking at the top hopper to see how many items are inside. When it notices that there are more items inside, it will increase the signal strength, which will trigger the redstone torch, which will unlock the bottom hopper, which will then pull items out of the top hopper until it's back down to a certain number, which will lower the signal strength from the comparator, which will turn back on the torch. Comparators also allow for automated timers such as this. So depending on how many items you have in the hopper will increase the length of the timer. And so when the comparator notices that there are no items in the hopper that it's looking at, it will lose signal strength, which will turn off the corresponding piston, which will allow the other piston to activate, pushing the redstone block. The redstone block is locking one of the hoppers, which prevents that hopper from pushing its items back into the other hopper. 
Then you can pull an output off of one of the positions of the redstone block to give you a timer that activates every X amount of time, depending on how long you want it to activate. And we'll be going over all of the configurations again near the end of the video so that you can fully understand how they work and how to build them. But the comparator is just super useful, like it's so versatile that it opens up a whole new world of features. But now let's take a closer look at the signal strength provided by a comparator in regards to container fullness. So the signal strength is always going to be a percentage of fullness of the container. So if the container only has a single stackable item, it will always have an output of one regardless of the container. But the more that container is filled up, the higher the signal strength will become. So like this dropper has nine slots. So if we put nine non-stackable items in there, this container is completely full, which will give you an output of 15. When any container is full, it will give you an output of 15. Now written books on lecterns are a little more unique. They depend on how many pages that you made in the book. But just like containers, if you turn to the final page, it will consider it to be a full container, giving you an output of 15. Where if you turn to any less pages, it's like the container is just less full. You know, but if you make a book with 30 pages, you know, where you can turn each page 15 times, then you will get one signal strength for every page that you turn. So if you turn the pages six times, you will have a signal strength of six, but if you turn the pages 14 times to where you're one away from the end, you will have a signal strength of 14. And then if you turn the page one more time, it will have the maximum signal strength of 15. And so books are just like containers, except that you can easily influence how many items are in that container. So like here we have a dropper full of nine swords, and it has a signal strength of 15. You know, but with containers, you actually have to take items out, whereas with the books, you just have to turn the page to change the signal strength. Another useful feature that comparators have is their ability to compare signal strengths. So here we have a full cauldron has a signal strength of three, right? So we're sending a signal strength of three into the side of that other comparator that's looking at the lectern. What this means is that the lectern will need to have a signal strength of three or greater for the comparator to activate. So if it has a signal strength of three, you will get a signal strength of three, but if it only has a signal strength of two or one, it's being locked by the cauldron comparator. Basically, the comparator will compare the strength coming in from the side of it with its own strength. And if its own strength is less than what's coming in from the side, it won't activate. Now there's also subtraction mode. If you press interact on a comparator, it will turn on that little light and that will activate subtraction mode. In this mode, it will subtract the strength from the side input from the main input. So if we're on page four, then it will take four and then minus three from the cauldron, so we will get a signal strength of one. Or if we make the book have a signal strength of three, then three minus three is zero, so we won't have any signal strength at all. The main practical difference between subtraction and regular mode is in subtraction mode, you have three minus three, where in regular mode, it just needs to be equal to or greater than the side input in order to activate. And this feature allows you to make the fastest clock in the game. This is a comparator clock. For this to work, the comparator needs to be on subtraction mode because it's basically lowering its own signal strength by one, just really, really, really quickly. And so only the, the redstone dust on top of the yellow block or redstone dust that is three blocks away from the comparator is actually turning on and off. The other dust looks like it's turning on and off, but it's not actually turning off. So these two dust aren't actually ever turning off. So the way this works is that no matter what strength is going into the comparator, the comparator is subtracting from itself two less than that strength, which leaves the comparator with a signal strength of two. You know, so any dust past the first two dust will turn on and off. You can also slow this clock down or make it to where all of the dust turns on and off by adding a repeater next to the comparator like so. This will subtract 15 from the comparator, which is the maximum that redstone strength can be. But really, if you're gonna build a slower clock, you should just build this repeater based one. It's simple, cheaper, and more compact but it's just always good to know what all you can do. Which then brings us to the T-flop. You know, this is the easiest T-flop that you can build and it uses a comparator, a dispenser, and a bucket of powdered snow or a bucket of water. We'll go over that in a minute. But basically, you know, if the bucket is full, that's a non-stackable item, which has a signal strength of two. But if we activate the dispenser, now the dispenser only has an empty bucket, which is a stackable item. So that only has a signal strength of one because the container is now less full than if it has a non-stackable item inside. You know, if it has a non-stackable item, that takes up one out of nine slots where a stackable item barely even, you know, fills up a single slot. And so then you can add a repeater at the end of the second dust to extend the signal further if you need to run it farther away. 
but this is by far the easiest, simplest, and most stable T-flop. And so of course you can always use a bucket of water, you'll just need buttons or blocks to make sure that the water doesn't flow. Or you could even use a bucket of lava if you're feeling dangerous. And now if you don't know exactly what a T-flop is, all it means is that it's toggleable between on and off. So every time you activate the dispenser, it will change from on to off. You know, so like a lever, every time you activate the lever, it changes from either on to off. Whereas a button, every time you activate it, it turns on and then off. You know, where if you attach a T-flop to a button or to a pressure plate, it basically turns that into a lever. Where if you jump on the pressure plate, it will turn it on. And if you jump on the pressure plate again, it will turn it off. And so anytime you activate the dispenser, it will toggle the output between on and off. So you can have multiple inputs, you know, as many as you want from buttons to levers to anything else. And if you watched last episode, you know that this is an SR flip-flop or an SR latch. But the main difference between this and a T-flop is with this, each button either controls on or it controls off. You know, pressing the on button over and over won't ever change the machine to off. It'll just keep trying to set the machine to on. Or with a T-flop, since all inputs are connected to the same dispenser, you know, all inputs will toggle it between on and off. It's also very easy to lock the SR latch just by using a lever on one of the sides. You know, locking one of the pistons to the on position using a lever will prevent the other piston from moving until you turn that lever off. So really, the SR latch and the T-flop are very, very similar. Uh, the main difference, though, is just the number of inputs. You know, technically, the SR latch has two separate inputs, two different pistons that you're activating. And then the T-flop simply has one input, the dispenser. Whereas the outputs are completely irrelevant, because on the T-flop, you can split the output into two just by using a redstone torch. So now you will have one lamp that activates when the T-flop is on, and another lamp that will activate when the T-flop is off. But learning how to build and use these two configurations, the SR latch and the T-flop, will open up a whole new world of redstone for you. There is just so much you can do when you learn how to influence the number of input activations. I remember with my own redstone journey, once I learned the SR latch and the T-flop, my redstone really took off. You know, before I learned these two configurations, I would struggle with just doing basic complex doors, you know, or even basic mini games. But as soon as I learned these two configurations, you know, everything just became easier and a whole new world opened up. But there are two more configurations that would really help your redstone journey, and that is clocks and timers. Now again, this comparator clock is the fastest clock that you can possibly build, so it's great for using it with dispensers or droppers. Just remember that it will only activate components that are three or more dust away from the comparator. Whereas if you just need a slow clock, you can build this standard one that probably everyone knows about by now. And then the last basic configuration that I think everyone should know is the timer. Now this one isn't used all that much, but I have found myself in various positions where I need a timer. And this one can be anything from 5 seconds to 5 minutes. So definitely take the time to learn how to build and how to use these four configurations. You know, once you learn how to build the SR latch, the T-flop, the clock, and the timer, you will be able to build basically most custom redstone creations that you can possibly come up with. They are the fundamental building blocks for custom redstone. So let's wrap up this video with some examples of how these configurations are actually used in-game. The main thing I find myself using the timer for is to control minecarts. You know, now it does have a signal shortener on here, which I will go over in our next episode, how to shorten and lengthen signals. You know, but in general, you don't want your minecarts on your farms to be forever moving. If your minecarts are forever moving, you're just causing lag for no reason. Whereas if you attach a five minute timer by having five stacks of items in these hoppers, you know, the minecart will only activate once every five minutes, which will ensure that it picks up all the items and cut down on lag. Now you can also remove one of the comparators and switch that comparator's dust with a redstone torch and then run a button to that torch. So now whenever you turn off that torch by using a button or some other input, it will activate the timer one time. So the timer will run for as many items as you put in the timer, and then it will turn off and not reset. Where with two comparators, it will just keep going forever and ever, but this basically allows you to make a button that lasts for 30 seconds, or a button that lasts for five minutes. You know, I've used this on certain farms to trap players in areas so they can't leave and mess up the farm. You know, I've used this for door controls so that you have a button that keeps a door open for like 30 seconds. 
you know, this is just a really nice configuration, you know, for custom extending of signal duration, basically. You know, since you can make a button that lasts for 30 seconds or for five minutes. Now, when it comes to clocks, again, for most instances, this basic clock is totally fine. You know, if you don't need a super fast clock, you know, just build this configuration right here. But if you do need a super fast clock, mainly for like bone meal dispensers or for dropper elevators, the comparator clock is just great. But again, just make sure that the components that you're trying to turn on and off are at least three dust away from the comparator because the first two dust does not actually turn off even though it looks like it does. Just keep that in mind. But nothing is faster than this comparator clock, you know, so most components can't even keep up with it. Like if you try to use a lamp, you know, on this, the lamp will never turn off because the redstone is just ticking way too fast. But for things like droppers and dispensers, they can keep up with it. You know, so for dropper elevators or bone meal dispensers, the comparator clock is the way to go. But in my opinion, the T-flop is by far the most useful and the most revolutionary mechanic. You know, being able to turn a button into a lever, you know, is just fantastic. And not only does it turn the button into the lever, but you could press a different button to turn it off. So it's like superior to a lever. You know, there are times that you want to use a lever, but you don't actually want the, you know, the lever, you know, but with a T-flop, you can run three different, you know, buttons or three different pressure plates to the same dispenser, and now all three of them are basically the same lever. You know, you don't have to go back to the original lever just to turn it off. You can just press one of the other pressure plates or other buttons, and it will, like, flip the lever to the off position. You know, I mean, this is just revolutionary for everything from doors to, like, all sorts of custom redstone stuff. Then the SR flip-flop or the SR latch is really great at creating custom inputs. Like, you can just use it for a door, of course, like I've shown many times, or like I'm showing now, with a lever that, like, locks the door open or closed. You know, but you can also use it in complex machines that, like, it turns on when the player activates the first button. But then it doesn't reset itself until something else happens. You know, so, like, when a player goes through the entrance to a dungeon, you know, it sets it to on. And then when the player leaves the dungeon, it resets it back to off. You know, since you can have different inputs split between on and off, it allows you for more complex mechanics. And since it also activates only one time until you reset it, you know, the set button only works one time until you reset it. So, so you can do things like a dispenser that only drops one item at a time until it is fully reset. You know, all in all, these four configurations will open up a whole new world. So definitely practice these four configurations, you know, and putter around on the comparators as well. You know, comparators really open up a world of kind of advanced, interesting redstone-y stuff, you know, and, and it's kind of hard to explain all in one video, especially how exactly the signal strength works, you know, because signal strength is different for each container depending on how big that container is. You know, but that's all we got for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it made sense. If you liked it, don't forget to like, favorite, share, and subscribe. And if it didn't make sense, feel free to ask me questions in the comments. I will do my best to answer any question that you have. And even if I don't know the answer, I will do some research for you to try to figure it out. I am here to help, so if you have any requests or comments or anything, please let me know. Comments are really, really helpful for the video. And you can check the video description for a link to my Discord. You can join that Minecraft community to share pictures of your builds, ask me questions about redstone, find players to play with, or find worlds to play in. Really anything Minecraft related that you would like to do. But that's all we got for this episode. Thank you again so much for watching. I really hope you liked it. And if you're one of my subscribers coming back to watch yet another Minecraft video, you are totally awesome. It is because of you that we can keep this going and that I can keep making videos. So thank you so, so much. You mean the world to me. But that's all we got for this video. So until next time, I've been your host, Omeletu, hopefully teaching you a redstone trick or two and reminding you, as always, don't forget to have fun. Bye-bye.